Hello. What's up? I was about to start without a microphone. Always good to have a microphone. Actually, while I'm saying that, let me check and make sure it's the right microphone here. Yeah, cool. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me. I got a great guest for you. I got some great topics to cover. I'm also live on Rockfin, so go over there if you haven't already. But uh, really, I hope you become a member at patreon.com slash Lee Camp, because if that happens, then there may just maybe be something somewhat similar to Redacted Tonight. At least you'll have the passion, the feel, the comedy, all that good stuff. That might happen if enough people become members of Patreon dot com slash Lee camp but that's not why we're here today we're here to talk to an amazing journal journalist kevin gastola he'll be here any minute um but yeah we're gonna cover a bunch of topics but then after uh i'm done chatting with him i i have some more for you so we're gonna have a lot going on on this uh this show but i figure we might as well uh dive right in rather than waste anybody's time um Kevin Gastoli is the managing editor of shadowproof.com. He's the uh, the curator and writer for Dissenter Newsletter, and he's the co-host of the Unauthorized Disclosure Podcast with Rania Kalik. And all of those are excellent. You should check out all of them. Hello, Kevin. Hey, Lee. Hey, thanks for joining me, man. How are you doing? Oh, you know, it's uh, the, in the world of unemployed, it is excellent. You're the first person in like the last couple of weeks who actually gave me an answer about themselves. Most people now seem to think that they need to like assess the state of the world and like take it all <laughs> in. And like they can't say they're feeling good. They feel guilty because there's a war going on that like they can't say that they might actually be having a decent day. It's really bizarre. True, but if they actually, if people in America just cared about whether there was a war going on, that means we wouldn't have been saying how we felt for 20 years now. Because it's uh, true, it's true. You know, <laughs> why, why, where was that reservation when we were bombing the hell out of Iraq? You know, yeah, yeah, not so much. No, just this, just this one. Um, anyway, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining me. Your work has been excellent as always. Um, I want to get I want to get to several topics, but I figure I'd start with this one since she just died yesterday. Friend of the show. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but I thought I'd start with a uh, let's see here a little a, a little clip for us to enjoy of Madeline Albright. Let's see. Here we go. What do you have to say about dictators of countries like Indonesia, who we sell weapons to, yet they are slaughtering people in East Timor? What do you have to say about Israel, who is slaughtering Palestinians, who impose martial law? What do you have to say about that? Those are our allies. Why do we sell weapons to these countries? Why do we support them? Why do we bomb Iraq when it commits similar problems? There are various examples of things that are not right in this world, and the United States is trying. <laughs> I uh, really am surprised that people feel that it is necessary to defend the rights of Saddam Hussein, when what we ought to be thinking about is how to make sure that he does not use weapons of mass destruction. I'd like to shouting just a moment i'm not defending him in the least what i am anyway he goes on to uh he goes on to just repeat what he had said because he obviously did nothing to defend saddam hussein but uh yeah just a nice pivot there but i, I just thought i'd uh, i saw you were commenting on her her legacy and i thought i'd get your thoughts well, it's become routine for me to offer what I think should be the appropriate eulogy for people who die. We've had Colin Powell, who died last year. I think Donald Rumsfeld actually went not long before Colin yeah. Powell. And, uh, and, you know, it's important that we not let the New York Times be the only one that gets to write the obituary for the people who ran this country. Because if, if we do, then... Um, at least for those kinds of people, uh, you're only going to read about the things that they did that were 
universally acclaimed that were and, and sometimes they'll even put a spin on their warmongering that makes it seem like it was virtuous of them right to be or, so or, belligerent. or it was a str- like with colin Powell, it was a struggle you know he was a real he yeah. was a he was one of those struggling warriors trying to do his best <laughs> well you know it was his cross to bear that he was made to lie us into a war in yeah. front of the un almost like he didn't have a choice like he like he couldn't have resigned and said, I'm not going to go do this, which anybody in his position would have been able to do. Even uh, though he got he got to that position by helping cover up the My Lai massacre in Vietnam. So <laughs> yeah. it was, he had proven so himself. So with Madeleine Albright, you know, we have a figure who I'll just work backwards. I mean, in if you're very young, I pointed out that most people probably have seen Madeleine Albright as this figure who was a kind of um a hanger on when it came to Hillary Clinton's campaign, just was always um, finding ways to get back into the media, did some campaign stops and very infamously said to uh, a a rally uh, that if you were a young woman who was considering voting for Bernie Sanders, that there was a special place in hell for you if you went and voted and did not support Hillary Clinton. And I I love the way that people who are boosters of Madeline and also supporters of Clinton are spinning it right now. I had multiple people, I've seen multiple people saying, well, this is like a phrase that Madeline Albright used to say all the time. She would say special place in hell. It's like, so it doesn't make it any better though that she had this catchphrase that she would (laughs) use whenever she was upset at somebody that she would say, you know, you deserve a special place in hell. I mean, I guess... Wait, so when she, when faced with the fact that there was a primary and Hillary Clinton had to actually beat somebody if she wanted to be a nominee, her reflex was to tell people that they needed to go to hell? Like, that doesn't really sit well with me. I'm sorry. As a defense, it doesn't make it any better. But uh, then you add in her, you know, what she did as a professional, like why she is revered. And it's because of her work as a, as a diplomat or um, she was secretary of state and uh, was in the Clinton administration. And of course, you know, you played that clip. Another clip you could have played is the clip of her talking about how the price was worth it. If over a half million uh, Iraqi children had died. Um, Well, no, no. Saying half million had died and, then asking her if it was worth it. And she said, yes. we believe it was worth it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And this was from the sanctions. This wasn't war. We were talking, we're talking about a policy that is actually a favorite. Uh, if anything, she is uh, the model of, uh, uh, of, of what liberal hawks think is the way to go about getting U S foreign policy accomplished. Like to me, Madeleine Albright, another way to put it is to say that George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and that lot, those neoconservatives are just unabashed imperialists. They're not going to apologize for it all. Whereas for Madeleine Albright, it's a more reluctant kind of imperialism. And, And again, I guess to go back to the way we were talking about Colin Powell, to walk around acting like, oh, it's our cross to bear we have to be this empire and sometimes it's hard and we have to make difficult decisions. Uh, but I have a few, um, uh, I'm just, if you want to really understand Madeline Albright and how hawkish she was, I have a few uh, quotes that I brought with me, which is one that um, she apparently once said to Colin Powell, and it was a taunt. What's the point of having the superb military that you're always talking about if we can't use it? Yeah, the, the U.S. needs to use our military more. That's really our problem. Yeah, um, and so, um, and um, it's pointed out that uh, she, in fact, was part, so in the 1990s, it may not feel like it right now because we are at, in a war against Russia, it feels like, but uh, the Soviet Union had fallen, and, uh, you know, it's absurd to think that, like, when I was in kindergarten, there was something called a peace dividend, but it actually existed. And uh, for like a moment, there was this like fork in the road and we could have chosen, um, okay, go this direction and divorce ourselves from the military industrial complex or go this other direction and keep doing what we do and be an aggressive 
for an, a, a superpower and we chose to be the aggressive superpower. And so they started, since they no longer had the Soviet Union, to decide that they're going to push around um, countries um, in order to uh, not just uh, for military objectives, but they are going to push around countries for the U.S. economy, that they were going to engage in belligerence in order to enforce our agenda when it came to the economy, and then that we would be policing these global crises. And so that's where you know, one of the things I pointed out was, um, in fact, this is not really my, I, I don't really know um, where I come down on the conflict, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the fact of history is that Madeleine Albright should be seen as a notorious person because right before the Rwanda genocide, she was aggressively pushing for UN peacekeeping forces to be withdrawn from Rwanda and knew that there was a threat that the genocide could happen and yet still pushed forward with removing. And, you know, these are the same people today who right. would say that, you know, if you know the, the, the so-called R2P crowd, as I label them, the responsibility to protect, these are the people who say, if you can save those people, then why not use force? Well, even under her own metric, she didn't protect Rwandans. She found some cynical motivation for why those peacekeeping forces should not be in the country. Um, yeah, we did a, uh, my podcast with uh, Graham Elwood, the government mm -hmm. secrets. We did an episode on how the Clinton administration, like you're saying, knew a genocide was, could happen. Then they knew it was happening and they basically just denied reality through all of it. So two more things that we can move from Madeline, but she said, if you have to use force, if we have to use force it's because we are America. We are the indispensable nation. We stand tall. We see further into the future, which is perhaps probably the like best pronouncement of her viewpoint. And then she said, um, we will behave multilaterally when we can and unilaterally when we must. Uh, so just there's not really a whole lot of difference between her and Dick Cheney when you get right down to it. There just isn't. There's, there's, there's not a lot. Um, and in fact, I guess, you know, the one thing they have in common is they probably never thought that um, gay and lesbian people weren't um, inhuman. Um, so, so, so <laughs> that, that they, was their they one, probably, one thing they united on. Yeah, they, they probably thought that they could uh, join the military and, and advance the U.S. empire as as equals. So, um, so yeah, like uh, to me, I I weighed in, and I think it's important to do these threads when these figures leave. You know, I'm gonna be ready for henry kissinger i'll be laying on the <laughs> button um and i'll be I'll, I'll be ready for uh dick cheney and, and any of these other figures who we just can't let be rehabilitated by way of death you know like I th just I think, they die. yeah dick cheney will never die i think he's on his third pig heart at this point <laughs> uh but so uh moving on to julian assange i mean You've done such an excellent job covering uh, Assange's plight, covering each step. Uh, even I have, even though I try, have had trouble kind of keeping up with every appeal and every how exactly they shoot down the appeal or what exactly is being appealed or whether there's future appeals that could happen. And so I saw the other day you and others were, were saying the uh, UK Supreme Court had s uh, slammed the door on uh, Julian Assange's appeal and the extradition request would go or may go to the British Home Office for approval. Can you talk more about that and whether there are any appeals left in this process? Well, so uh, essentially uh, what we've seen very clearly is, uh, and I'll just say that I think the more that I've covered this case, what we need to do is not overcomplicate it. I mean, we can we can have a long discussion, you and me, about the legal nature of the Supreme Court and uh, the way the process works in the British society and, and, and all of that. Uh, but I don't think it would be a good use of your viewers' time. I mean, basically, when you get down to it, the United Kingdom is a client state of the US, um, but different, I think, than like maybe a Gulf monarchy who does our bidding. Um, because they actually have maybe more independence or they're actually choosing this in perhaps a way that those monarchies are not. Uh, and 
essentially what I'm saying is that when you look at the British government, this is something that I've been taking the last few months to really focus on with my newsletter. I'm having people um, like Mohammed El Mazi and Kit Clarenberg write some pieces to to look at the relationship between the U.S. and the U.K. and basically um, how it's so willing to do the U.S. government's bidding when it comes to laundering U.S. intelligence, pushing U.S. propaganda, uh, putting um, its stamp of approval on U.S. military actions, being there. I mean, this goes all the way back to Iraq, right? Like Bush is going to invade Iraq and he goes and he gets Tony Blair in order to invade Iraq and have somebody who can be on the U.S.'s side while our, our special state. relationship, right? Yeah, this is our special relationship. And so this thing, what has become apparent to me is that the reason why the UK is not going to stop the extradition of Assange is because it is a priority to serve the United States, to maintain diplomatic relations, to have a good relationship with the US, and to deny the US government Julian Assange would be to jeopardize that relationship. And in fact, if you think that that has nothing to do with the case, I would invite people to go read when the lower court's decision, the district court decision, the one in which the judge just happened to uphold Julian Assange's human rights to the you know disgust of the US government. Then this right. appeals court basically she agreed with every tenet of the case against him except said that US prisons are uniquely painful and harmful and and he could kill himself. Yeah, exactly. And so now the U.S. government was faced with this issue, because if it's true that Julian Assange can't be extradited to the U.S. because, uh, one, he suffers from mental health issues and other physical ailments, and so the U.S. prisons would not be able to take care of him, then what does that mean for future extradition cases? Uh, because what are, what are you going to have to do to, what are you going to have to overcome if the courts in the UK believe that there's a possibility that people are going to be tortured before they even make it to their trial date. Uh, and so this high court of justice ends up ruling in favor of the US and in it, it actually mentions uh, that there's no reason to doubt these new assurances that have been offered all of a sudden by the US government that they are going to treat Julian fairly, and that they are going to treat him uh, by, uh, you know, they're not going to put him under these certain confinement conditions, which is a supermax prison. They're not going to send him to put him under this thing called special administrative measures. They're not going to deprive him of having um, a psychiatrist if he would need a psychiatrist. They're not, uh, they're also going to offer him the ability to go serve his sentence in Australia if he would like. That's the that's that's the way they presented it. I don't think any of those claims are valid. I think there's major loopholes in everything they said. But at face value, right. now after they lost, in order to save their extradition case, they just come out of nowhere with these assurances that were offered by the State Department. It's actually not from the Crown Prosecution Service, which pushes the case for the U.S in the courts. In fact, what happened is, let's say, uh, Tony Blinken, or someone who represents Tony Blinken, goes to the UK government with these diplomatic assurances and says, here are the reasons why you don't need to be worried. And then those become part of the legal case. And so it's not evidence. I mean, there's this really like bizarre absurdity to this, where it's like, you can't even contest these assurances because the court refuses to recognize them as evidence. And in fact, they're after the fact. So there's no point where Julian Assange's team can even call witnesses and show how they're total bullshit. And wow. so, so, so what happened is this high court of justice overruled that judge. And then that's where we are today. That's why we are where we are today because they overturned that lower court. We are here and faced with Assange now waiting to find out uh, what Pretty Patel, Pretty Patel is in the home office. She's, you know, part of the British cabinet. And they're the office that one, uh, reviewed the request and then decided that it was legitimate to send it to the courts for review. And then now they're the ones that are gonna sign off on it and allow him to be put on a plane and brought to the US. So he can't, there, there's no, 
I get that those that 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 appeal was shot down. They can't appeal anything else. No, they can. Um, I think uh, one reason why it's a little bit hard to follow right now for Assange supporters is I don't know if the Assange legal team has made up their mind on what to do next uh, because they are right now, they have four weeks. Well, So it's going to go to a court. It's going to go to back to the lower court. The, it's already at the lower court, which is the Westminster Magistrate Court. This is where Judge Vanessa Baretzer ruled. And then sh- that court is going to send it to the home office. And once it's in the home office, then there's four weeks in which Assange's legal team can submit their own arguments for why that office should deny the request. And they can make a big political issue about it, and they probably will. And I'll write about it, and you'll talk about it, and we can all call attention to what's going on here. And then if she approves the request, it's highly likely that they'll try to pursue a appeal of the issues that have been entirely ignored up to this point, which is how Baretzer did not recognize that Julian was a journalist, did not recognize that uh, he had press freedom rights, did not recognize other things related to this case that are of huge significance. Um, kept especially, him, kept him yeah. in a giant Tic Tac container through the whole trial. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a box for, for some of it um, that he was kept, kept in this glass box. Uh, that, that, was, that was new for me. I didn't, I didn't know British justice had that. Uh, it, well, but, it was full on Silence of the Lambs. I mean, it was yeah, f- fucking crazy, and it made it look like he would if if they like didn't have the box around him, he'd just start uh, biting people's faces off. <laughs> well, I I would tell people that here in the U.S. we don't even put people in a box. Uh, you just get shackled at your ankles. You come out in an orange jumpsuit. You uh you you look like okay, you look really dangerous, but you've got shackles on your legs. You've got you might have to sit in your chair in cuffs. Who knows? But you get to sit with your lawyers. Right. You know, he had to make an. Uh, he had to ask the judge for permission if he could sit with his lawyers. He wanted to because he couldn't understand. See, one of the things that was, I don't know if you remember this episode, but it's worth just reminding people very quickly that there was a point in these proceedings that took place in 2020 where he couldn't hear what was happening in court, and they gave him these goddamn stupid headphones that he'd sit back there and he put on his ears and he pretended like he could hear it, but he couldn't. So he just took it off and he put it on his chair next to him. And he sat there and he has no idea what is happening and he can't follow the proceedings. So he asked his legal team if uh, the U S and the the judge would let him sit with his lawyers and uh, the, the crown prosecutors say they don't object. Uh, The legal team of course makes their, appeal to the judge. And the judge says just because she's on a power trip that no, Julian Assange isn't going to be allowed to sit with his attorneys and come out of the box so that he can follow and participate in this case. So in a larger sense, so I guess, I guess you're saying we don't, we don't actually know if this is the final moments or not. It's not. It's not. Well, I, I can, I can confidently say that it's not, but I don't know what is going to I don't know what order it's going to unfold. Uh, the legal team seems to be saying that they're going to, because because they didn't come out immediately and say, we're going to appeal. We're going to file this appeal with the high court, which is the appeal court. And we're going to say that um, we think Julian Assange is a journalist. We're going to challenge all these issues. Because they didn't do that immediately, it seems like they are going to they're going to see what pretty Patel and this home British home office will do with the Assange extradition. And it seems like when they put their stamp of approval on it, then they might try to appeal. Um, or maybe, maybe they're waiting for something that I don't know about, which is like a formality to see that the Westminster court actually has it. All I could tell you is that, um, what we know is there are a couple options that the legal team have and it and neither of them are good. Yeah. Um, and in fact, what we're seeing is the possibility that Julian Assange will be put on a plane before the end of the year, because it's very likely that they'll be able to wind down this process um, before. Cause the high court can say, 
well, we don't want to hear your appeal. Um, we think the Home Office would approve of all of this or, or whatever they want to do. And then the Supreme Court, if he goes to the Supreme Court, can say, well, yeah, the high court denied this. And and yeah, we think this is this should just be sent to the office and he should be extradited. I mean, and, and you know, then, of course, all this play by play is just to is just the details of a really horrific situation where the U.S. just wants to torture him for as long as possible. I mean, even if he were to get out tomorrow, uh, it, it, it would be they, they would have viewed it as largely a success in that it it really did crush him. It crushed him, you know, his health. And he's had a stroke. He's uh, in just had so much trouble and that's a win for them. You know, they were able to do this to someone for revealing their secrets, for revealing their war crimes. Uh, so, again, even if he got out tomorrow, that would be the that would be the situation. And it'd be all just to wear us down, wear him down further. I mean, all of this us us honestly, like I have to cover all the developments just because I'm so committed to this case. But I think for. Uh, the, the wider conversations about this, I, I, I empathize with people who say we can't lose sight of the actual issues. We can't lose sight of what is really at stake in the case, because we, really what this is, and that's why I made an emphasis about the UK being a client state, because what is really the problem here, and, and also it's worth it's worth noting, um, there was some good bit of reporting from the classified UK, the smaller outfit in, in the UK that does actually at, at far more risk than us, um, does reporting on the security state apparatus in the UK uh, and covered how there's this media freedom initiative. And Amal Clooney was actually a representative of this media freedom initiative at one point and then um, resigned um, for, for reasons I think that in, included Assange, but also involved other things about how the UK was not upholding press freedom. So she didn't feel like she could be a representative of it. Um, I know at one point she was um, all linked to Julian Assange's uh, defense team, uh, but apparently this media freedom initiative, when, when this all happened, uh, everyone in the government were really like freaked out that uh, while they were trying to push this media freedom event, uh, everyone on Twitter and, and, and all throughout the world were just saying, well, this looks hip hypocritical on the part of the UK. You've got Julian Assange in jail, and you're sitting here talking about media freedom. And uh, they they didn't they, they really didn't know what to do in response to it. Uh, but they're willing to be seen as hypocrites as a service to the United States. Um, and uh, even though there are so-called European human rights principles that have been historically upheld in Britain, um, you know, you've got a complex political climate right now, what with the aftermath of Brexit, and they don't really have to follow European Union human rights, um, and uh, Boris Johnson doesn't really care about norms um, any more than Donald Trump cared about norms, and so they can just allow him to go and be brought to the United States, and they're willing, they're willing to do that, and then the Biden administration is willing to do it for reasons that I think are relevant to some other topics we were going to discuss and get into, which is that I think Democrats truly believe that Julian Assange is a Russian asset or was a Russian asset. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and that's, and that's why he's not allowed freedom. I mean, we don't really yeah, have to. Over I don't, I don't know whether it would matter whether it was Russian or they accused him of connect being connected to someone else. Uh, I, I think the fact that he revealed so many of their crimes is really that that's what did it. it. You know, yes, they've claimed, oh, it was to help Russia. Of course it wasn't. But, you know, they, they could have pinned it on any country that they viewed as an enemy state. Just just to push back, though, because yeah, okay. I, I, cause I could have spent a lot of time on this. And one of the things I've wrestled with is how Biden's administration could continue if he was part of, you know, Biden was part of the Obama administration. And an important part of history is that the Justice Department had a shot at indicting Julian Assange back in 2012, 2013. And they were, you know, they were, they were putting together an aggressive grand jury investigation. Uh, at that time, Chelsea Manning was also going through her court martial. 
And they had che- they had Julian Assange uh, where they wanted him. Uh, I mean, he was in the Ecuador embassy, so it would have been a, a barrier, I suppose, to an indictment, or they might have claimed it was a barrier. But uh, they were looking at this seriously. And Matthew Miller, who comes out of the Justice Department, he was a spokesperson, has conceded and, and shared that they had recognized this New York Times problem, which I know you're aware of, that if they were to charge Julian Assange, then they would be obligated to consider charges against the New York Times and uh, the Washington Post and these True. other news. And so so I guess what I'm saying is um, the Obama administration ran uh, into this and, and, and looked at everything that you're saying about like the war crimes, the Iraq and Afghanistan. They saw the allegations of OK, you publish these documents, you put informants in jeopardy. You know, the indictment against him right now, a lot of it hinges on, you know, you publish these military documents. You made it possible for these uh, our enemies on the battlefield to attack people who we were taking care of. Uh, but what changed? What changed is two things. And it's in the indictment. One is Julian Assange and WikiLeaks helped Edward Snowden get out of Hong Kong in uh, 2013. This was actually during the trial against Chelsea Manning, and they were assisting Edward Snowden. And so that made the Obama administration change their view considerably about whether they would allow the CIA um, and any other intelligence agencies to engage in campaigns against WikiLeaks to disrupt their operations. And so so, so that was when they were willing to target him. And we, we know from Yahoo News's report that they were willing to let the CIA also then go after Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald and, and those people who were working on the Snowden documents. And so now they are willing to treat WikiLeaks as something different than uh, an organiza- a journalistic organization. Um, they, they, they now believe that it was probably more um, like an intelligence agency operating like a rival intelligence agency that they could go after. And that's why you hear Mike Pompeo then label it a hostile intelligence agency in 2017 in his first speech as CIA director. Uh, There's the vault seven materials when they publish the, the the cyber warfare documents um, that show the different ways that, well, one of them that's really relevant is that apparently uh, the CIA has the capabilities to mask their fingerprints and make it look like they're engaging in hacks from Russia or engaging in hacks from China. Well, at the same time, it wasn't like, yes, the Obama administration made that choice to not indict. Uh, obviously, that was a good choice for the moment. Uh, but it wasn't like they went easy on Assange. I mean, they had essentially got him trapped in the Ecuadorian embassy. True. Uh, so, it, you know, and and. Biden might not have agreed with the decision to not indict, even though he was in the administration. It's not like they really consulted uh, crazy Uncle Joe for for all this stuff. So true. But anyway, uh, but my my point is, uh, in my opinion, it's kind of a small point. I mean, they they wanted to get him for what he revealed. But yeah, yeah. But my point is, uh, I think for us, if we're trying to fight the battle of getting the charges dropped, why can't we get the charges dropped against Julian Assange? And I think to me that the issue of, of why, uh, no matter the fact that civil liberties organizations and human rights organizations have come to his defense, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, there are actually editors of these newspapers who put out statements. I mean, they I, look, I'll, I'll concede that they haven't really done enough to follow this case, and they've barely showed any interest in the role of the CIA in trying to target Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Uh, they don't really even care that there was a Spanish private, uh, a Spanish security company that yep. engaged in an operation that targeted journalists, even targeted their own journalists, like the Washington Post. Ellen Nakashima had her own cell phone battery almost stolen by someone operating the security checkpoint at the Ecuador embassy. Um, they don't care about that. But despite all of this. I hesitate to use the word solidarity, but it's the simplest way to put it. Despite the fact that they're saying they oppose this prosecution, you're still not seeing any movement politically and nobody within the Biden administration feels moved to change the way that they are approaching this case. And you don't see support in Congress, even though we're talking about press freedom issues that at least progressives should be able to support. So the reason why I don't think they would 
is because of that thing called Russiagate that we lived through for three or four years that um, has now developed into a, like a completely entrenched political dynamic that is calcified right now with the war in Ukraine. Well, may, maybe I'm a little more uh, a little more sim- cynical or a little a slightly more uh, conspirac- conspiratorial minded, maybe. Uh, I think they they came up with the idea of Russia Gate in order to pin Hillary's loss on Russia rather than the FBI because for like five days they said it was James Comey's fault after the election and then they go oh maybe going after the FBI is not the best plan for the Democratic Party so they switched it from James Comey who became a national hero to Russia did it um, and it served two purposes it was Russia did it via WikiLeaks well now we can go after. Russia and Julian Assange and Trump all as one big package deal of, oh my God, it was the Russians. And so to me, it serves a lot of purposes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, regardless of how we got here, you do agree that we have a fundamental problem in convincing people that Julian Assange uh, should be freed because there are so many people you thought were on our side who say, well, uh, he supported Donald Trump in the election. I don't know if we can get behind him. Or, or, oh, uh, uh, we believe that he helped uh, Hillary Clinton get elected. And so that's that's a problem. And I I, I just, I'm sorry to, to push this so hard, but when the, my, my own view is that when, or, or to share a, a, an emotion that I felt, like I don't usually get emotional when we have these decisions from, these courts in in Britain, but uh, because of what is happening in Ukraine, when the high, sorry, when the Supreme Court ruled, and it was just a one line ruling, but when they denied him his day in court to bring an appeal, I just felt this pit right inside me. And I went, oh, now's the moment when we need to convince our politicians not to let this go forward. And I can't think of a worse time to try and convince them because because yeah. I had always I had always imagined that when it finally came to the day that Julian Assange was being put on a plane, we might be able to get the Biden administration to back down because one one thing I had said before and the reason why I I I, I, I guess I'm holding myself accountable here because I don't know if it's going to end up being true. I had suggested that they were basically just punishing Julian Assange by process. And that they didn't really want to put Julian Assange on trial because there is an image that the U.S. empire has to uphold. And you could play on your show today if you had them handy. Uh, It would be a good idea for a show later if you haven't done this already. Is a collection of the authoritarian leaders who have invoked the jailing of Julian Assange in order to make the U.S look bad and to also say we don't have to listen to you as you're lecturing to us about uh humanitarian rights um there's the azerbaijan leader who 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 did this um china's foreign minister has been doing this repeatedly um and uh so so now when we have to create an issue and convince our politicians not to let this go forward We're in a worse spot because of the war in Ukraine than we were uh, before. Um, Or we're in a worse spot than I imagined we would be when this finally got to a place where he would be put on a plane. Because I thought it actually might be longer. I thought that when he was going to be put on a plane, it could be like 2023, end of the year, or 2024, Joe Biden and the White House would be facing a re-election, and I don't know if maybe they wanted to like deal with this issue. Or I, I, again, I'm I'm not really I, a politician, so I don't know how strategy goes. But I I kind of a, I kind of agreed with you that they just wanted to you know basically torture him through process. But I kind of thought it would be Britain that would back down, that kind of wanted an out eventually. Obviously, Britain's going to do most of what America wants. Uh, so it wasn't like I thought they were going to come running to his aid and go, no, we would never jail a journalist. But I thought they kind of wanted an out to not be seen extraditing a journalist, a publisher, the the most accurate publisher who's ever lived, considering nothing has ever been false. Um, I thought they kind of wanted an out to not actually extradite him. But now I don't know if that's true. So, Yeah. 
Um, well, Kevin, I think I've used up enough of your time. I really do appreciate you being here, joining me. I highly recommend uh, all people check out all the work you've been doing. We've been putting it up uh, a lot at radindymedia.com. Um, anywhere else you want people to follow you? Uh, your Twitter's on the screen there. Yeah, yeah no, um, just thanks for the support. The newsletter is uh, the center. That's the dissenter.org. Oh, there's not a lot right now. I'm actually working on a book, so I'll just I'll plug that. Um, I'm doing an Assange book that should be out in early 2023. Uh, so there's not a lot of output M right now. Make sure you have it end with him being freed. Yes, yes. Please, um, it's please a, do it's, that. It's, uh, let me specify. Sorry, it's a fiction book. I'm doing a <laughs> fiction book on Julian Assange. And at the end, uh, right. not only do, do they get to have the wedding day they should have had, uh, which we actually didn't, I, we neglected to mention, but I just want to say very quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to take a minute to, to, to squeeze this in. Yeah. Uh, people might have seen the beautiful and wonderful images of Stella Morris in her wedding dress um, and Julian Assange's children in kilts. Uh, they looked excellent. Uh, the wedding party looked um, as good as any wedding party. And uh, they had the wedding in Belmarsh Prison. And the thing that people who watch your show need to know, Lee, is that uh, Craig Murray was supposed to be a witness for uh, this uh, wedding, supposed to be able to attend and be part of the wedding party. And, and Craig Murray is a former uh, British politician. Yeah, uh, yeah. and also went through his own legal case. He was jailed uh, because he covered the trial of, uh, of a Scottish minister um, and they were, uh, it was a, involved sexual allegations and he was accused of jigsaw identification um, and basically treated as a second class citizen because he was a blogger and not someone from the BBC. So he ended up being sent to uh, jail. Anyways, I don't want to go off on that tangent too much, but he has had his problems with British authorities and they said he could not be a witness because it would be a security threat if there was a photo taken of Julian Assange and uh, Stella that ended up appearing in the media. Uh, so they could not allow a journalist to be part of the wedding party. So no journalists were allowed to be members of this wedding party and be present at this uh, only family, only the people um, who were shown in that picture. Like Gabriel is, uh, um, and then I think Assange's father was there as well. Yep. Only these people would be allowed in. And I think this is a good point to end on is that um, I'll, I'll leave you with this thought is that this shows you the fragility of what they're doing to Julian Assange. I mean, we can be cynical. We can believe that there isn't any hope for Julian Assange, but with this wedding, we saw that there is actually a way that we can reach and, and get to them and force them to back down because they were afraid that if people saw an image of Julian Assange marrying Stella Morris in prison, that it would be so outrageous and say so much about how inhumane and cruel they have been to Julian, that they made certain that nobody snapped a photo. But we all, we all have our imaginations, right? We all know what it's like when people get married. We've all seen weddings. We've watched plenty of romantic comedies where people get married. We don't need a fucking photo to know how beautiful it was when they got together and kissed. Although I love hilariously that Stella says a guard told her that there would be no open mouth kissing allowed. Like they were <laughs> fucking teenagers. Like, like, no, like, like she was going to give him a razor blade through her <laughs> mouth from one mouth to another. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, but I also just imagine them being prudes and not wanting like some really like full on involved kiss that they would have to watch while they were waiting for this wedding to conclude. Um, in any case, it was beautiful. It was defiant. And the fact that they were afraid of a photo just shows that there are still ways that we can win and free Julian Assange. And I think that's a good point to leave you. Thank you. I hope so. I hope you're right. And uh, thank you so much, Kevin. Keep doing great stuff and uh, keep fighting. All right. Later. Later. All right. That was Kevin Gastola. I have a lot more for you, though, before we wrap up here. Um, if you have a second, please uh, check out patreon.com slash Lee camp. When this ends here, like I said, if I'm able to get enough, really, I mean, it's, it's almost entirely small dollar donors over there. So the lowest level is a dollar 25 a week, uh, $1 25 cents. Um, and if I am able to get enough of those, then 
hopefully I can recreate. And, you know, I think we're getting kind of close. Uh, recreate something that that has the same feel and passion and and uh, you know those those type of things, same comedy as redacted tonight, um, even if it will never be exactly the same. But I so I hope you'll check that out. These videos that I do here, um, they go out live obviously, and then they basically will live afterwards for now on patreon.com slash Lee Camp. So honestly, if you you know if you appreciate my work, if you think I've done good stuff over the years, um, then I hope you'll do that because, you know, we got 730 people watching right now. And, you know, if just a, a, a fraction of those were to become members, then I think I would be there. I would have enough to actually create the show. But anyway, let's uh, move on. I have some information on Ukraine that I think is not what you're hearing <laughs> right now from your, uh, your average, uh, you know, Definitely not your average mainstream media. Um, let's see which one I want to uh, show you first. But so there was a mainstream media article, which is pretty mind blowing that it's somewhat mainstream media because this is the only one I've seen like this, that they had the balls to do this, uh, to be, oh, Dave said something about buying a, uh, uh, oh, my new book. Well, my new book won't be out for a bit, but if you mean the bullet points and punchlines, actually, if you sign up at patreon.com slash Lee Camp, uh, you get a free PDF of my book, but I suppose I can't sign a PDF. Um, I mean, I could sign my screen. I don't know that that's going to help you much. But anyway, as mainstream media article, I'll, uh, I'll pull it up here in a second. And it's from Newsweek, which I guess is owned by MSN. Uh, which, uh, because it's this seems to be Newsweek on MSN. Um, but you'll see as I go through it that it is not, it's not the reality you're getting from your mainstream media uh, on Ukraine. And it's coming from a very legitimate source. So let's go through some of this. And then I have another kind of mind-blowing video after this that I'll show you that also has to do with Ukraine. So right now, and keep in mind, folks, in case you need to be reminded or in case you've never heard of anything I've ever done, uh, I have no dog in this race other than for the truth. I no longer work at RT America. I am oh, the only money that I have coming in right now is from Patreon, from you guys. Uh, so there, there's no, you know, there's nothing like that. People loved it. As long as I was at RT America, even though I wrote all my own stuff, was never censored and was never told what to say, people still wanted to believe that, that oh, well, he, he can't. He, since he's calling the American empire to account for all of our endless bombing, for all of our endless killing, for the six million we've killed during these uh, war on terror over the past 20 years, then he must be. He must be told what to say. Well, no, I wasn't then. But now, even if you did want to believe that, nowadays... I'm not paid by anybody but you guys, so you're calling yourselves the manipulators, I guess. Anyway, this is a Newsweek article on MSN, which is hilarious because of MSNBC, you know. Uh, they're no, no one's more for propaganda garbage than this. But Putin bombers could, uh, Putin's bombers could devastate Ukraine, but he's holding back. Here's why. And they go into a pretty detailed analysis of what's going on over there. All right, you don't need to see stupid ads. But uh, and they're quoting from, well, I'll get to that in a second. So the article says, as destructive as the Ukraine war is, Russia is causing less damage and killing fewer civilians than it could, U.S. intelligence experts say. This is coming from fucking U U.S. intelligence experts. Meanwhile, our mainstream media is telling you the opposite, okay? And our, and our government heads, Jen Psaki and B Biden and all those, they're telling you exactly the opposite. Meanwhile, this analysis is coming from U.S. intelligence analysts, for fuck's sake. So let me keep going through this. Russia's conduct in the brutal war tell, tells a, of course, 
and there's there's still some manipulation here. I mean, yes, it's a brutal war, but all wars are brutal. There's there's never been an unbrutal war. war. Uh, there's never been a nice, polite war. Uh, and by the way, I've said many times, and I will continue to say that I am opposed to Russia's invasion. I'm opposed to endless bombing. I'm opposed to 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 killing of civilians, uh, whether intentional or unintentional. But as you'll see in this article, it does not seem like your mainstream media keeps trying to tell you that Russia is targeting civilians. But let's keep going through the article. Russia's conduct in this brutal war tells a different story than the widely accepted view that Vladimir Putin is intent on demolishing Ukraine and inflicting maximum civilian damage. And it reveals the Russian leader's strategic balancing act. If Russia were more intentionally destructive, the clamoring for U.S. and NATO intervention would be louder. And if Russia were all in... Putin might find himself with no way out. Instead, his goal is to take enough territory on the ground to have something to negotiate with while putting the government of Ukraine in a position where they have to negotiate. Now, again, none of this means I endorse fucking war, but don't you want to know the goddamn truth? I mean, even if you're if, if, even if you're fucking just like, oh, it's all Russia's fault. I don't care if NATO expanded. I don't care if there's if, if we've been funding an army's Nazi, Nazis in the border regions. I don't care about any of that. I, it's all Russia's fault. Even if you believed all of that, wouldn't you want to know the truth? Wouldn't you want the fucking truth as to what's happening? Because if your answer is no, then that says a lot about you, and it says a lot about what you're trying to say. It says a lot about your beliefs. If you really don't want the truth, Moving on, understanding the thinking behind Russia's limited attacks could help map a path toward peace. What? Knowing the truth could help us solve the problem? No way! In nearly a month since Russia invaded, dozens of Ukrainian cities and towns have fallen, and the fight over the country's largest cities continues. United Nations human rights specialists say that some 900 civilians have died. 900. Now, that number is far lower than what you're hearing on your mainstream media. That doesn't make it okay, okay? But I want the fucking truth. My allegiance is to the truth. Uh, let's see. US, you, you, the U.S. claims the number is much higher. About 6.5 million Ukrainians have also become internally displaced, 15% of the entire population, half of them leaving the country to find safety. The destruction is massive, a senior analyst working at the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, tells Newsweek. All right, so think about this. This is... A U.S. intelligent agent, intelligence agent uh, at the DIA who is being briefed on, the gr uh, on what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, and he's not some pawn of Russia. He's not. This is not Russia. I'm not reading from some, from some Russian newspaper or something. This is our own intelligence, and he's speaking anonymously because you can't tell the truth without reprisal. But I think in a minute they also mentioned why he, another reason he's speaking anonymously. Uh, so he tells Newsweek, especially so the destruction is massive, especially when compared with what Europeans and Americans are used to seeing. Oh, what we're used to seeing in our neighborhoods, you know, as compared to, oh, I don't know, the Middle East, where we just fucking turn whole cities into parking lots. But in Europe, it doesn't happen as much because they're not brown. So we don't bomb them as much. But the analyst says. The damage associated with contested ground war involving peer opponents shouldn't blind people to what is really happening. The analyst requested anonymity in order to speak about classified matters. I think the real reason is if you're telling the truth right now and you're in the intelligence agencies, uh, you're in trouble if they know your name. Uh, so this analyst said, quote, the heart of Kiev uh, or Kiev has barely been touched, and almost all of the long-range strikes have been aimed at military targets. In the capital, most observable to the West, Kiev city authorities say that some 55 buildings have been damaged and 222 people have died since February 24th. It is a city of 2.8 million people. Now, again, this doesn't make it okay, but 220 people have died in a city of 2.8 million these are not because because your mainstream media is trying to tell you that that Putin and Russia are just uh, trying to obliterate civilian targets and it's utter horseshit. And you should want the truth, no matter where you come down on all of these issues. I don't care if you're fucking Republican, Democrat, libertarian, leftist, progressive, Marxist, fucking I don't I don't care if you're just into water gods, uh, just a Poseidonist. You should still want the fucking truth. Here's another quote from the intelligence analyst. We need to understand, 
Oh, wait, no, this is, uh, this is, sorry, this is a retired Air Force officer. We need to understand Russia's actual conduct. <laughs> you think? A lawyer by training, the Air Force officer, um, who has been involved in approving targets for U.S. fights in Iraq and Afghanistan. So again, these are still warmongers. These are still people approving targets in Iraq and Afghanistan. But even they are like, maybe we should know the truth about what's happening there. The officer currently works as an analyst with a large Pentagon contractor advising the Pentagon and was granted anonymity in order to speak candidly. Again, you can't speak out for the truth unless you cover your name up. As of the past weekend and 24 days of conflict, Russia has flown some 1,400 strike sorties and delivered almost 1,000 missiles. By contrast, the United States flew more sorties and delivered more weapons in the first day of the 2003 Iraq war. Yeah, you remember shock and awe? That was hitting civilian targets. That was what it looks like to obliterate civilian, innocent civilians and not give a fuck. That was what it looks like, all right? Uh, again, not defending Russia's invasion. Just want you to have the truth. The vast majority of the airstrikes, and again, this is coming from the mainstream media and an intelligence analyst. All right, I'm not reading you from uh, from Fucky McFuck's blog, okay? Uh, the vast majority of the airstrikes are over the battlefield, with Russian aircraft providing close air support to ground forces. The remainder, less than 20%, according to U.S. experts, have been aimed at military airfields, barracks, and supporting depots. A proportion of those strikes have damaged and destroyed civilian structures and killed and injured innocent civilians because war is disgusting and awful. And even when you're trying not to hit civilians, you usually end up hitting civilians. Even before, oh, sorry, uh, killed and injured innocent civilians, but the level of death and destruction is low compared to Russia's capacity. Even before Russian ground forces reached Kiev and other cities, this narrative goes, the air and missile forces would have so damaged Ukraine, including its communications and other infrastructure needed for defenses to continue working, that it would secure victory on the ground. Russia has not achieved any of these goals. So this is where they're saying that Russia has not achieved the goals they were hoping for as quickly as they had hoped. Part of that might be because they are uh, so carefully focusing on these uh, military targets and not just trying to level cities. There has been no methodical Russian attack on transportation routes or bridges to impede Ukrainian ground forces or supplies. Though electrical power plants have been hit, they are all in contested territory or near military installations and deployments. None have been intentionally targeted. In fact, there has been no methodical bombing campaign to achieve any systemic outcome of a strategic nature. Air and missile strikes, which initially seem to tell one story, have almost exclusively been in direct support of ground forces. Russia did not bomb stationary air defense uh, emplacements protecting cities. U.S. analysts say Putin's generals were particularly reluctant to attack urban targets in Kiev. Are you starting to get the point here? The invasion is wrong. It shouldn't have happened. The NATO expansion is wrong. It shouldn't have happened. The neo-Nazis we've been funding heavily and continue to fund and the fucking arms we're giving them right now is wrong and it shouldn't be happening. None of this should be fucking happening. Yet the truth is Russia has not been just bombing civilians. And if you like, it, it amazes me if people don't want the truth and they accuse you for being a traitor for revealing the truth. You want to know how many fucking complaint letters I'm sure Newsweek for this article is getting right now of people saying, you're a fucking traitor because you revealed the truth to us. Russia, the DIA analyst adds, has also been careful not to cause escalation onto Belarusian or, or Belarusian or Russian territory or to provoke NATO. Despite operating from Belarus, Russian ground and air operations have mostly been confined to the southeastern portion of the country, and the attacks in western Ukraine have been careful to avoid NATO airspace. None of this is to suggest that Russia is not at fault for its invasion or that the destruction, the civilian deaths, injuries, and dislocation aren't due to its aggression. The officer requested anonymity because he's being privately briefed on the war by the Pentagon and is not authorized to speak to the news media. Also, if they found out that you gave the truth to the public, uh, your career would be fucked. Um, and I'll give you one last little bit of this. And then I also have a clip that basically supports what is being said here from a former colonel in 
our military. Um, quote, this is the intelligence analyst again. I was initially puzzled as to why more long, long range missiles haven't been sent into Kiev and other major cities like uh, such as Odessa, and also why long range aviation hasn't been used more in strategic attacks. But then I had to shift to see the war through Putin's eyes. Caught with his pants down, perhaps Putin indeed. I don't know how much he was caught with his pants down, but who knows? Maybe he's right. Caught with his pants down, perhaps Putin indeed uh, pivoted after he realized that Ukraine wasn't going to be a cakewalk and that Kiev wasn't conquerable. Maybe he decided to solely focus on taking territory along the periphery and linking up his consolidations in the south to be in a position to hold enough territory for, uh, sorry, to extract concessions from Ukraine and the West, security guarantees, or some demilitarized zone. I'm frustrated by the current narrative on mainstream media, he says, that Russia is intentionally targeting civilians, that is demolishing cities, and that Putin doesn't care. Such a distorted view stands in the way of finding an end before true disaster hits or the war spreads to the rest of Europe, the second U.S. Air Force officer says. Ha! Huh. Knowing the truth and talking about the truth would fucking help us solve this and not end up in fucking nuclear war. Sorry for my French. I don't know. Do the French curse that much? I don't know if they really do, actually. Um, plus, in fuck, in French is a seal, isn't it? I think it's like a like a seal, like in the water seal. So it's not really, it's not French at all. Anyway, uh, so that's a mainstream media article. You can look it up, Newsweek. Um, it's easy to find. Uh, and you can send that to your to your idiot family members who uh, who will only read mainstream media articles and think that anything uh, that is from an independent journalist must not be true when in fact it's the reverse. Generally, the independent journalists are the ones who are actually telling the truth, and the fucking mainstream media is just paid liars, uh, like on everything. So. Hear that. Uh, so, again, none of that is to say I'm supporting this war. I'm fucking opposed to this war. I'm opposed to all wars. I'm opposed to us funding and arming Nazis in fucking Ukraine. I'm opposed to the 2014 coup we funded and armed, the Maidan coup, uh, to put in a U.S.-backed puppet. I'm opposed to every step that, the, that America has taken to try and stop the peace process. Zelensky is basically doing what we tell him to do, which is not create peace, not come up with a solution where there are no more bombs falling. Uh, uh, oh, someone's asking me. I, I can uh, I can put the link to this in the uh, comment section. This article, in case you want to. Uh, this is the MSN Newsweek article. Um, okay, so here's another clip, basically backing all that up from a former top Pentagon colonel and well, actually two clips I'm going to play. And it's from uh, the Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate. Hope you've heard of them. Great journalists. Uh, so I'm going to show you, let's see, uh, two two clips. They They interviewed... Uh, they interviewed uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor, former ah, former. Uh, uh, okay, really not letting me hit the pause button. That's all right. Jesus. So um, he was in the Defense Department. He was in the Defense Department under Trump. And what's kind of interesting about him, if you watch the full three hours that I think Max and Aaron do with him, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to show you three hours of clips. The clip is like one minute. But what's interesting about him is he is not, he's not a leftist, right? He's not a, he's not a peace guy. He's not running around going, no more war. He's not anti-American empire. He's a right-wing uh kind of, you know, he's, he's just, a, I mean, I don't know if he's a full isolationist. I don't know if he'd call himself that, but he's against, he's against our wars, our, our endless wars, because he views it probably, I, I, they didn't even say this, but he probably liked the other one, like the other right wingers, 
uh, that are that take this stance. He, he views it as just it's just dwindling the American empire. It's it's uh, exhausting resources. It 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 makes us out to be just fucking endless murderers. But anyway. Whatever his position, I think it's interesting that this is not a left winger. This is a this is a military guy, military born and bred. And in fact, in another part of the interview that I'm not going to I'm not going to show you the clip because uh, I, I don't want to take the time. But uh, Aaron Mate happens to mention that, uh, you know, the U.S. military in the past has, in fact, gone after civilian targets like in Vietnam. And uh, you could tell the colonel was got jumped in there and he was like, Aaron, I have never seen a military man go after civilians. So. This is not a left wing. I'm just trying to make that point. So if you think, oh, this is just, you know, left wing garbage. Nope. You would be wrong. So, all right. Here we go. This is the uh, first clip. War continues. Is peace possible and why is Biden seemingly so hostile to negotiating and de-escalating? Well, at this point, I think we have to conclude that there is a universal opposition to any peace uh, arrangement that involves uh, a recognition of any Russian success. Uh, in fact, if anything, it looks more and more as though Ukrainians are almost incidental to the operation in the sense that they are there to impale themselves on the Russian army. I'm going to, I'm going to keep playing it, but uh, I just want you to remember that sentence. The Ukrainians are there to impale themselves on the Russian army. They're incidental. That's what our, that's what our deep state is doing. That's what our military industrial complex is doing. That's their view. And I this is exactly what I fucking said, except I didn't have a general saying it to or whatever, a colonel. Uh, this is what I, I believed. And I said on previous videos that the U.S. is using Ukraine's cannon fodder. This is a proxy war between America and Russia. And we don't give a shit about innocent civilians. In fact, we'd like for Russia to kill more innocent civilians because then we get to point to that and go, oh, my God, look at that. All right, let's continue and uh, die in great numbers because the real goal of this entire thing is the destruction of the Russian state and Vladimir Putin. And no one is prepared to stop anything as long as there is the slightest hope that something terrible will happen to Russia and to Putin. Of course, I don't see much evidence that that's going to be the case, but it doesn't really matter here. Uh, everyone has universally signed on for the Russian hate campaign or hatred for Russia campaign. And that seems to go on regardless of uh, what is reported. And, and frankly, the absence of much truth in reporting and, and a lot of wishful thinking in its place is hard to uh, overestimate or exaggerate. It's So there you go. One minute that I feel really sums up all of this one minute from a retired colonel in our military who was a, an advisor in the defense department uh trump actually put him up as an ambassador to germany um douglas mcgregor wait did i get the name right uh yeah douglas mcgregor and it really does sum up exactly what I've been saying what others have been saying. We are told by our mainstream media that we should care about Ukrainian civilians, and we should. And yet all of that, the endless 24-7 love to Ukraine, people doing little hearts painted yellow and blue, all of that is actually to keep this going. It's a propaganda campaign, and they are not actually trying to end this war, to end this invasion by Russia. And like that colonel just said, the Ukrainian people are basically incidental in this equation. Their job as our military industrial complex, our deep state, Joe Biden, his administration, et cetera. And of course, the Republicans, the neocons love it, too. So because we have one political party, right? We don't. It's not Democrats and Republicans. It's all one big pile of shit. They're all loving this. 
This allows them to basically try to evict Russia from the economic system, uh, which I'm going to talk more about on my uh, my next video next week, uh, on another video next week. And they are willing to let as many Ukrainians as possible die in order to, as as Colonel McGregor just said, in order to try to cause harm to Russia. Uh, they're hoping something bad could happen to Putin. They're hoping that the Russian people could turn against Putin. They're hoping that uh, that the, the, the economics will work out, that as they try and crush Russia with sanctions, it'll succeed and it'll cause their society to maybe collapse economically. They're hoping for all that. Now, they don't seem to be calculating the, the fucking backlash, the, uh, the blowback economically, uh, which, again, I'll get into more next week. But uh, Russia is going to fucking put the hurt on Europe. And you end up in these, this economic tit for tat, which ends up being almost an economic uh, mutually assured destruction. Uh, you know, we, we tend to view that term, that phrase with nuclear weapons and the end of days. But you collapse everybody's economies and it's not pretty and millions die. So this could be an economic mutually assured destruction that the Biden administration is not calculating. Uh, they have cut Russia out of essentially the the global economic markets. Uh, yes, they still have China, which China and India are getting bigger. And, you know, you combine China, India, Russia, and they're far bigger than the United States economically. But uh, it doesn't seem like they've actually thought about the economic blowback in this. Uh, gas prices shooting through the roof, et cetera. But I want you to remember that clip. Because that fucking clip says it all, and it's coming from a right-wing colonel who has sources in the Defense Department that he's talking to. Uh, and later in the interview, he references those. Uh, this is not a guy who's out of the loop. And yet he, he knows what's going on over there, and it's not what your mainstream media is telling you. Yeah, it's fucking don't support war. I'm not telling you to cheer Russia. I'm not telling you to cheer bombing. I'm telling you, you should want the truth. And the only way you can end this thing is to fucking have the truth. You're not going to end it by just closing it. Oh, I don't want to know that Russia's not intentionally bombing civilians. I don't want to know that that Russia hasn't been bombing Kiev. I don't want to. It's like fucking take the truth, learn the truth, and then make your argument with the truth. Don't just call anyone who tells you the truth a traitor. For fuck's sake. All right, I got one more clip from General McGregor. Uh, let's see. So this is about, uh, this is his view, and this is actually where he differs from the Newsweek MSN article. Uh, well, they kind of agree at first. Uh, they, they, the, the question that I'm about to play is, do you think Russia is overwhelmed? Newsweek said Putin was caught with his pants off uh, and didn't realize that Ukraine would put up such a, a fight, which I think, well, I mean, I could just let the clip speak for itself. I think they kind of half agree that that maybe that maybe Putin and the Russian forces were surprised uh, by the response. But where he differs is he and I think most people with a military brain think if Russia wanted to, they would just. Congratulations, Sorry, AARP. Yeah. Over a billion Shut dollars. Up. Wow. Fuck. That's what AARP was paid in corporate royalties. <laughs> sure. Okay. Let's see if I can get that right. Ah, shit. That's the wrong time code. Well, I'll have it in a second. Um, okay. One more second. Okay. Here we go. Or estimate or exaggerate. It's terrible. What do you make so far of the dominant narrative we're getting here in the U.S. that militarily that this has been a disaster for Russia? that Ukraine is putting up fierce resistance that Putin mm -hmm. did not expect and has inflicted serious military defeat on the Russian invaders. 
Well, as to the last point, it's very obvious that what Ukrainian forces are still active are entirely surrounded, cut off, and isolated in various towns and cities. Uh, the Ukrainian forces are incapable of anything but an occasional pinprick attack on on something that doesn't appear to be very robust or dangerous. So the war, for all intents and purposes, has been decided. Did you catch that? I'm just. I just want to pause here for a second. Did you did you catch that sentence? The war, for all intensive purposes, intents and purposes, has been decided. Now, is that what you're getting from your mainstream media? Is that what they're telling you? No, because their goal is to make Ukrainians and Americans and the West and so many others think that this is an ongoing, really long war. And that they don't want you to think it's over. They don't want you to know that it's militarily over. Uh, and it's really disgusting. And they, because they want more people to die. They want this to go on and on. They want Russia caught up in this fucking garbage for a long time. And they want to see a lot of people die because that allows them to put more sanctions on Russia. It allows them to do more of their anti Russia propaganda. Again, a lot of it, a lot of the anti Russia stuff can be true. This is an invading force, but I'm saying they're heaping extra propaganda on top of that uh all right let's continue the the issue for the russians from the very beginning has been how do we proceed without killing large numbers of civilians and inflicting a lot of property damage and putin gave very strict orders from the outset that they were to avoid these things the problem with avoiding it is that it has slowed the progress of the operation to the point where it has given false hope both to the ukrainians but I think has been seized on by people in the West to try and convince the world that a defeat is in progress when, in fact, the opposite is the case. So the, the war itself at this stage of the game could be decided very, very rapidly, uh, permanently, if Putin were to give the order and allow the forces to disregard the concern for civilians and property damage. But he hasn't done that is continued to negotiate, even though he recognizes that the people sitting across from him really are not in a position to deliver very much. They're being told what to do. And it's very obvious that Washington wants this to continue as long as possible in the hopes that uh, Russia will be desperately harmed. I just don't see that happening. The there you have it. That kind of sums up everything that's going on here. And it, you're getting none of it from your mainstream media. Your corporate media is trying to turn Ukraine into Syria. It wants the same shit. Uh, obviously, the United States, if you look at Syria, obviously, the United States wanted Syria to fall, wanted Assad to fall. But they didn't achieve that. However, in place of being able to achieving that uh, and being able to achieve that, they destroyed all of Syrian society. And now they have sanctions that continue to economically destroy Syria. So to them, that's still a win. Yeah, Assad is still in power, but we have fucking wrecked that society. Uh, we have made it so that they cannot have a strong and sustaining uh, country there. And the U.S. views that as a win because it allows us to continue our global hegemony. Um, so they, they want something similar in Ukraine for slightly different purposes, but uh, they, they, they're trying to make Ukraine a new Syria. They want this to go on for years. They want fucking door-to-door guerrilla war combat going on. And they want to then be able to say, oh, uh, Russia's committed all these war crimes. Um, they, oh yeah, they used, uh, R Russia used, uh, chemical weapons, right? And that's what they may be prepping for is something like that, where they say, oh, Russia used chemical weapons. So we are going to do a, B and C it's a red line for us. They did this in Syria, right? Now think about it. Why the fuck would Russia use chemical weapons? It'd be insane, right? Cause Russia has overwhelming military force well stronger than anything Ukraine has. So if Russia wanted to dominate Ukraine, as this colonel just said, they would do it. But they don't want to kill that many civilians, so they're not doing it. Uh, again, not supporting the invasion, okay? Just keep reminding yourself of that. Um, 
but it's easy for the U.S. to set up a kind of false flag like that. We now know in Syria that we set that line, that red line, right? Chemical weapons, red line in Syria. We now know those were false flags. Uh, you have reporting from acclaimed journalist Robert Fisk, Seymour Hirsch, Aaron Mate did tons of great reporting on it. Um, John Pilger, and you have four whistleblowers from the OPCW, the most uh, well-known, the, the top chemical weapons watchdog uh, agency around the world. Those four whistleblowers have come forward, and we now know that of the two or three chemical weapons attacks, uh, all of them either did not happen at all or were done by the actual rebels that we claimed were the ones fighting the good, fighting for good, right? But what did that do? Well, it served a purpose. It 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 serves more than one purpose. One is it gives the United States a reason to to bomb or NATO a reason to bomb. Uh, it also by saying, "Hey, there could be a chemical weapon attack," which, by the way, Biden is now doing. Um. You give the the Ukrainian military, the neo-Nazi brigade, brigades over there that we've been funding and arming, you give them a reason to do a chemical weapon attack, right? Because they can do it, point to it and say, look, Russia did a chemical weapon attack. And then they get all of this uh, military backing that they're hoping for. Of course, that's getting us closer and closer to World War III. It's getting us closer and closer to nuclear war. It's fucking insane. But here is uh, Joe Biden just the other day. I think it's uh, yesterday. Joe Biden says NATO will respond if Russia uses chemical weapons. Well, boy, you're kind of setting the stage there, aren't you? You're kind of setting the stage for this to fucking happen. It's insane. It is pushing us ever closer to nuclear war. And even if it doesn't end in nuclear war, it's pushing us ever closer to just like obliterating Ukraine in some kind of proxy war. It's in fucking sane. And that's our leaders, right? Fun Uncle Joe. What a good guy. What a good guy he is. So that is the reality on the ground. I've given you a mainstream media article. I've given you a former colonel retired colonel, uh, the mainstream media articles quoting from people that are current uh, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, current Air Force. Um, and they're behind the scenes, they're all saying the same thing, that Russia has not been just intentionally bombing civilians. Again, I don't support this war. I don't support Russia doing this. I don't support Putin doing this. I don't support any of that. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't want the truth. And the truth is, they're not just bombing kids because it's a good time. Uh, I mean, it, it amazes me that people really don't want the truth. They're really like, you know, you know the number of people that probably will turn off this video just because I start to read that article from Newsweek? Just hearing that, oh, no, God, I, oh, the truth hit me in the face. Ah, I can't get it off. I can't get it off. That's uh, Honestly, that's the fucking response. It's amazing. So, yeah, let me see. I think that's all I have. But I hope you feel like you got something out of this. And if you did, please consider becoming a member. Patreon.com slash Lee Camp. You get exclusive videos over there. You get, uh, I'm always answering questions. I'm available over there. And you get uh, a PDF of my book, Bullet Points and Punchlines, if you sign up. And the lowest tier is $1.25 a week. Um, basically, I'm, 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 trying to go this route of, of independent uh, funding. No longer no longer on some big bad TV station because obviously, as, as most of you know, the station was shut down from U.S. sanctions. My show canceled. Uh, all of the previous eight years of YouTube videos now banned globally, banned around the world. Uh, and my podcast deleted from Spotify, my podcast Moment of Clarity. You can listen to that sometime when you get, when you get a chance. Uh, I mean, it's mostly videos like this. It's the audio of these. Um, but I have two other podcasts, Common Censored and Government Secrets, both of which I think you'd like. But all that is to say, patreon.com slash Lee Camp. Get exclusive content. 
And uh, I couldn't do it without you guys. So keep fighting.